But obviously that doesn't satisfy all of what Isaiah has to say. There's much more in view. Let's go back to Isaiah briefly, quickly. Isaiah 65, where Isaiah begins to explain what the benefits are of this new creation that God has made. And he enumerates four or five or so blessings that I want to touch on briefly. First, there is this fullness of joy, verses 18 and 19. This fullness of joy that comes about in this new work of creation. You recall in the first work, God, after his six days of creative labor, rests on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, and calls it blessed. At the end of each day, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. God enjoyed his creation. There was beauty to it. There was glory. There was wonder. God rejoiced in that great work. And here, Isaiah almost takes that around, and in this new covenant age, as we begin with the Sabbath, as the first day of the week through Christ's resurrection, we anticipate the glories and the joy of God's new work of creation. And so God says, be glad in that which I will create. Be glad as part of your present experience now, anticipating what God has in store for you in these next six days of creative work. God invites the church to rejoice, to be filled with joy for what is yet to come. Be now glad that what I will do, that joy should fill your heart. It's the joy of what God will do in Jerusalem and in the people of God. God building a new city, gathering His people together into that city. Rejoice in the work of His church. The gathering of God's elect throughout the earth. Not just simply in little communities like Percy and elsewhere, but in God's heavenly city where we gather. Do you rejoice in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it your joy and blessing to meet with the people of God, to fellowship with them around God's word, to spend time together in prayer and in worship? Rejoice and be glad. The kingdom of God brings a fullness of joy. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, the pure in heart. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and so forth. We enjoy that blessing even today. But look at how wonderful Isaiah puts these words. This joy is not really on the horizontal level among us. We are to be joy, joyful people. But wonder of wonders, God Himself will take joy in His people. God will delight in you. Can you imagine that? Me with all my sin, all my weaknesses, all my failures. Nonetheless, have God delighting in me. Can you say that? Can you fathom that? God will so make a transformation in your life that He Himself will be filled with delight and joy. Like parents who look at their children and feel a great sense of joy in their time of play. God blesses us with joy and He Himself jo takes part in that joy. And so you have this fullness of joy. Joy among the people of God. Joy within God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Joy intensively. Joy throughout the world. Be glad and rejoice. For I will create a new heaven and a new earth. Robust health. People will live in extended lives. Someone who lives or dies at the age of 100 will be considered accursed. <laughs> we got something to do here. I got to do my exercise a little bit more. <laughs> God will extend lifespans. Now, some again look at this and say, look, you've got people dying in this new age and yet extending long lives. And in some respects, it seems as though what you have is at the end of time, a reduplication of the beginning of time. You recall the period of time before the flood, between Adam and Noah. People lived these long periods of time, five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years of time. And so some suggest that perhaps at the end of history, almost kind of a chiasmic approach to history, lifespans will be expanded, and people will live for extended periods of time. 
perhaps through science, through blessing, what have you. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know so. I, I think we need to be very careful when we approach the text in that fashion. Um, Isaiah makes use of earthly language that was familiar with the people of his day to explain concepts that get beyond what human language can bear, or at least what the culture and the perceptions can bear at that time. I was reading in World Magazine a, a story about outreach to Muslim nations uh, among Christians who are translating the Bible into uh, languages, but using cultural terms and, and being culturally sensitive in ways in which Muslims can appreciate. Now, the problem with it uh, is that they began to, I think, walk away from orthodox understandings of God's Word. Since Muslims do not accept Jesus as the Son of God, then we try, they, they tried to hide the concept of Jesus being the Son of God, just spoke of Him as the Messiah. That's wrong. You've got to confront the culture and move the culture along. You've got to make them know who Jesus really is. And just accepting their understanding of things is not converting them, not changing them. They need to see it for the way it is. But at the same time, you can put it in their language, express things in words that they're familiar with as much as possible, but bring the truth along. By the same token, Isaiah uses language that people are familiar with to explain things that perhaps are a little bit beyond, that stretch them. Jesus spoke of God's free gift being eternal life. Perhaps that was a little bit much for the people of Isaiah's day to contemplate. But they could see perhaps living a long life here in this world. Is it possible that Isaiah is just simply trying to explain in rather limited ways the concept of eternal life? Living forever and ever. He uses temple imagery to describe the coming kingdom of God. Admittedly, that temple language and imagery is not sufficient to explain the powers of that coming kingdom. In any case, robust health for the people of God, beginning in this life, as you see, as Christianity and Christian cultures develop, science, medicines, and so forth, lifespans are expanding and increasing. Safety develops within the community. People are not violent anymore. They're living peaceably among each other. Children obey their parents, and so therefore they're not committing crimes. They're not out with drugs and alcohol and so forth. Christian faith produces longer life. Maybe it'll produce very long life. So there's robust health, fullness of joy. Now, Isaiah goes on to talk about fruitful labor. Their work will not be dissipated by others taking advantage of what they have done. People will build houses and plant vineyards and then be able to enjoy them. And not have those things taken away through foreclosures or repossessions. Uh, God will bless the kingdom of God in such a way that your labor will not be in vain. How many folks today are experiencing that, where they work for years, perhaps for a home, and then with the hard economy, they're unable to pay or keep up their payments and have to walk away from a, a mortgage, or from a home? Isn't that endemic of a, a culture that has in many ways walked away from God's standards and is suffering the consequences of it? If we follow Christ and His laws, or if we live in accord with the Scriptures, God's blessing will be on a culture, on a people. You see that in the book of Judges. The Midianites come in and take away. They sit and camp on the cropland of the Israelites so that they can't eat. They starve them out. Why? Because the Israelites were unfaithful to the Lord. And God was judging them. Walk with the Lord and you'll be blessed. And Isaiah shows that the people of God will experience fruitful labor. You will enjoy the work of your hands and see satisfaction in this life and in the life to come, most especially. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Answers to prayer will be rapid and quick. Even before you uh, voice your request, God will already be there with the answer. 
much different from much of our experience today where we ask and ask and keep on asking and seek and knock and persevere in prayer and be persistent. And finally, the answer comes <laughs> sometime. It seems sometimes we must go for long periods of time before God answers our prayers the way we had hoped. But here Isaiah says that the blessing of God will be such that even before we ask, the answer will be already there. We will be so in tune with the Lord, the Lord so in tune with us, that we walk side by side it's as though we are finishing each other's sentence. Husbands and wives know that you get to know each other so well that you almost know what the other one is thinking before they even express their thoughts. And that's not always good. <laughs> but you're so familiar with each other, you can complete their sentences. I, I did that once in the high school. I was at Philmont Christian County. My science teacher was scribbling away on the chalkboard, and he was talking about these vectors and how a line goes up here so much distance, and another one goes down here. And then he said, well, if we have one to this power, it'll go through the floor and down into the gym. And he said, and now what we need, and I chimed in, is a drill. <laughs> get through the floor and get down over here. But you begin to anticipate what the other person is thinking. Maybe he wasn't thinking that. <laughs> but here Isaiah sees a glorious time when God's answers to prayer anticipate our very sense of need. Even before we have the need or are ready to express a need, God is right there with service, ministering to our needs. And finally, an abundance of peace. Peace that is far surpassing anything that we could anticipate. Isaiah has already shown us many visions of peace where the leopard lays down with the goat and the lion with the lamb and so forth. God brings a transformation along the animal realm which is typical of human relationships where violent people are transformed. And meek and docile people are at peace with those who are more violent and aggressive. God brings the kingdom of God and people from all walks of life together. And there's an abundance of peace for the people of God. Animosities, anxieties, fears, hatred, malice slip away. And in place there's a wonderful peace. How do you describe the new heavens and the new earth? What words will we use to portray what is yet to come? Isaiah, in his own way, has only touched the surface of things, using human languages, human words, human pictures of things which only briefly touch the glories that are yet to come for the people of God. And so therefore have hope that's why Isaiah presents this to the kingdom of God, to the church. In the midst of your upheavals, in the midst of the struggles of life, as you see your body decay and things grow weak and old, look up. There's hope. There's a new heavens and a new earth. Things only get better for the people of God. If Isaiah had a hard time explaining these things, we may have a hard time grasping them, comprehending them, embracing them for ourselves with faith, and resting on them. That's the challenge for us. To see what Isaiah says and say, yes, it's true, and it's true of me. I will participate in that great glory because of what Jesus has done. You need to embrace that. Make it your own. There's a new heavens and a new earth. So be glad. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercies to us and for the wonderful ways in which you have blessed us in Christ. We thank you for the blessings that we now have of the work of your Spirit, the ministry of your Word, the fellowship of the saints. We thank you for our fellowship with you, uh, Sunday after Sunday and through the week. But we thank you that these are just a foretaste, a down payment, a pledge of that which is yet to come. We pray for the help of your Spirit, that we would understand your Word, 
and be encouraged by the hope that it presents, and that we will be faithful to you throughout our days. We ask it in Jesus' name.